and welcome to Answering the Call. I'm so glad you joined me tonight. I'm your host, Tiffany Sweely, and I have a great guest with me tonight. He is the pastor of the Father's House Church here in Laverne, Tennessee. He holds a Doctor of Ministry from Emmanuel Baptist University. He also holds a Doctor of Theology from Christian Life School of Theology. Would you please help me welcome Dr. Bobby Howard? Well, thank you. It's so wonderful to be here with you tonight. I've been enjoying your show. I've been oh, watching it at home, and you're just doing some wonderful, wonderful things for oh, the Lord. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's been a lot of fun, and I, I definitely enjoy teaching, but I'm so glad you're here. I'm honored thank to be you. here with you tonight. Awesome. We're going to have fun. We're going to have a good time. This Amen. is going to be fun. So, um, I love to learn from those who have been in the ministry for a while, and how many years have you been uh, full-time ministry? Full-time ministry, 18 years old, and uh, I'm 75, so what's that, 60? That's a long time. Long time. <laughs> <laughs> it's about 57, yeah. so about 60 years okay. that uh, the Lord called me mm -hmm. in 1957. Okay. I was 12 years old, and... When my dad came home, he was a pastor of the church, and he was out traveling, selling uh, uh, courses to college. Mm. And uh, he came home on Friday night, and Wednesday was when I had heard the call mm. uh, to go preach. And I told him immediately, he mm. said, good, you can preach for me Sunday morning. Oh, wow, Sunday and morning. And would you believe my daddy turned over his church filled to the brim mm -hmm. in Burlington, North Carolina. Nobody knew it. It was not an advertisement, mm -hmm. you know, that a 12-year-old boy is preaching. Mm -hmm. And God gave me David and Goliath. Oh, wow. Tiffany, I preached. Mm -hmm. I thought I had, he gave it to me at 1130. Church started at 11. Mm -hmm. It was a free will holiness church. Mm -hmm. You had to be through by 12 o'clock. Right, right. Or people get up and walk out. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So at uh, I knew, mm -hmm. I knew I had preached until it was 12.15. <laughs> and Daddy, I give the final prayer, mm -hmm. order call, and then Daddy comes up, and I sit down and look at my watch, and I have... Been up there for 10 minutes. I know. And it's all over with. And yes. so he finished the sermon for me. That That's was awesome. the first one when I was 12. That's awesome. Well, I think everybody remembers when God calls them uh, to whatever they've been called to, whether it's mission work or the ministry or whatever. But you said that you began as an evangelist yes. first. Yes. When, as, as a teenager, when people began to realize we were, we were uh, a small denomination, mm -hmm. uh, Pentecostal Free Will Baptist, mm -hmm. and there are about a hundred, a hundred and twenty-five churches. That's enough to keep you busy. Right, right. <clears throat> and there's a uniqueness of a young teenager, 16, 17 years old, 15 years old, coming to hold a revival. Right. God was gracious mm -hmm. that he gave an anointing. Mm -hmm. And no matter what I said, he he took it, he blessed it, and he fed the people. We had great, great results. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was 16, I, I went to Salemburg, North Carolina. I was there for a revival. What wasn't what I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a youth camp. Oh, right. But my daddy, the only one he ever booked for me, mm -hmm. booked that meeting mm -hmm. because the pastor said we were in prayer the people are getting saved in Sunday school and there was a spirit of revival mm. and she said we were praying and say God who do we get and mm. she said God said get your son wow and daddy said you don't have a choice because mm. God said mm. you're supposed to go I said well why didn't he tell me he said he <laughs> is right now <laughs> so we went to that that church and it was a three week revival wow and people were in the in, in the altar until two and three o'clock in the morning wow that's amazing we had unbelievable results at mm. age of 16. 
Wow, I'd love to see that again. But, you know, that just points out that God can use anybody yes. at any time, yes. at any age. It any doesn't age. matter. Mm -hmm. So how do how do people know that God is actually calling them? Some people may be questioning, well, I think God is calling me into this, but I'm not quite sure. Is there some things that you have told people just to help them understand that God is really calling them into some type of ministry? Yes, I, for me... I did not hear an audible voice, right? but there was a voice inside of me mm -hmm. that said, Bobby, preach. Mm -hmm. That was it. I was, I was praying outside. I had my best friend was inside with mother. She was ironing and something was on television mm -hmm. that they were interested in. And uh, I went in and I said, mother, God just called me to preach. And she said, good. And because she already knew mm. that it was coming, mm. and I, I didn't know that, but she had been praying, right? And they just kept on watching TV. Mm. And I found out later that they gave the reaction they were supposed to mm -hmm. because God wasn't finished talking. That mm. you know, sometimes we think we've heard all that God's going to say, ah, uh, yeah, but God doesn't give us long dissertations. Mm. It's a still small voice, and it may be two or three sentences, and then there's a pause because you've got to consume what you just heard. Right. I went back out the house and was walking on the sidewalk where I heard that inner voice. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I walked to the end of our house, and I looked up and raised my hands, telling the Lord, yes, I will do this. Mm -hmm. And I saw a cloud. And it, to me, was shaped like a man's hand mm -hmm. over my head. Mm -hmm. And to you, it might have been an elephant mm -hmm. or just a cloud. But mm -hmm. to me, God let me see mm -hmm. his hand. Right. And I heard that same voice. Mm -hmm. God's hand will be over your life always. Wow. God's hand will be over your life always. Yeah. And and that's in the book of Genesis. Right. And so everything in my call mm -hmm. was biblically based. Right. And some people, like you said, some people may have someone in their life that will um, stand behind them and, and reiterate what mm -hmm. has happened and say, yes, I already knew uh, like your mother did. And my parents did the same thing. They were right. very supportive, and they felt like that that they knew that's what God was going to do. But then you have other people that have to stand in it alone and just yes. trust God. Yes. And when I think about that, of course, I think about Joseph and how he had to stand alone and and what God was leading him into and the right. dream that he gave him. So sometimes God may give you a dream and show you what's to come. Um, and sometimes, like you said, it's going to be that still, small voice. So... Uh, if you don't have someone to support you and to believe in what you're doing, um, you have to really just hold on to your faith that, yes. that you know God God said that and that it's going to be fulfilled. If, if I were to give advice to someone listening today uh, and, and you feel that God has laid it upon your heart to do some particular ministry, I would go to my pastor first. Mm -hmm and share with them what you felt that God has placed upon your heart. Mm -hmm. And then they can search the scriptures to make sure that uh, they are following the call of God. Right. And and then have others. Uh, th there's safety mm -hmm. in a multitude of counselors. That's true. That is and true. And so when it begins to be confirmed, now what I didn't know was when I was six years old, my mother's dad, my granddaddy, that I spent much of my first 11 years with, mm -hmm. he died four days before my 12th birthday. Oh, wow. He never got to meet Dempsey. Mm -hmm. Mother was pregnant with Dempsey and was going to wait four days and tell him about her pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And that was on my birthday, but he died. Oh, wow. And... Uh, but he had told my daddy, mm -hmm. God's hand is on Bobby's life. Mm -hmm. Watch him and care for him. Wow. That's and 
So here was a confirmation mm -hmm. from somebody that daddy had a lot of trust in. Right. And my dad, being a pastor, mm -hmm. had been praying about it. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I had confirmation everywhere. There's right. never been a time mm -hmm. that I can remember a doubt on the call that God gave me. Right. And and preaching and ministering is a broad spectrum. It can be singing, mm -hmm. it can be praying, mm -hmm. it can be delivering the word mm -hmm. exegetically or just telling the story of Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, any, it's, it's such a broad mm -hmm. spectrum. Well, I know that your calling has developed through the years and morphed into lots of different areas. Yes. Um, I know you said you had traveled with uh, Jerry in the same golf. Yes, it is. So you spent time using your ministry in Psalm. Yes. And then um, you were the pastor at the Lord's Chapel. Right. And now you're the pastor at the Father's House. So right. um, just because uh, we may start in one area doesn't mean that that's where we're going to finish. So Amen. Um, talk a little bit about the transitions of life. Look, I, I had never, I pastored when we first got married. Okay. We got mm -hmm. a call. Uh, to come to a church if we would accept mm -hmm. fifty dollars a week. That's right. a huge <laughs> paycheck. And my wife was a teller mm -hmm. in uh, in a bank, and so between her pay and mine, and of course we talked about 1967. Okay. I stayed there until January of '72, mm -hmm. and the church grew. My salary doubled. I left making a hundred dollars a week. Awesome. That's so that good. was awesome mm -hmm. in, in five years. I learned a lot mm -hmm. during that time. And one of the things I learned was I don't ever want to pastor a church again. Right. Now that is <laughs> that is some hard work. Yeah. I should have known it because from before I was born, my dad was called into the ministry. Oh, right. So I grew up For watching that, watching mm -hmm. it, sitting in the back seat, listening to Daddy and Mother mm -hmm. discuss all of the uh, cons right. that they were facing inside the church. Uh, but I experienced it firsthand, ups and downs. Right. And so when I got the opportunity to sing, I thought I was just going to sing. Mm -hmm. But the second week that I was with Jerry, he got sick. Mm. He could not preach mm. that night. We were doing a Sunday night, Monday night, and Tuesday night revival. Mm. So he called me uh, in the next room in the motel and said, will you preach oh, wow. tonight? And that's hard mm. when people have come to hear, to one, hear one guy <laughs> and then you got another one filling mm. in. But um, God, was, God was gracious. Yeah. And from that day forward, I found that I wasn't just singing mm -hmm. the gospel, right. but I was meeting new people. Mm -hmm. But see, remember, I'm in this little circle of a little over a hundred churches, right? And doing okay, right? But now I am in the circle of thousands right. of churches mm -hmm. all over the United States, mm -hmm. and from one end of Canada to the other. Right. So doors are opening. Mm -hmm to be an evangelist again. Mm. And I jumped at that, Lord. Well, I stayed with Jerry for uh, singing, traveling on the road. Now I worked in his office for years. Right. I'd come home Monday and, and go to the office and take care of his work and take care of mine, mm. book dates for him and for me, mm. mine for booking churches for him. Mm -hmm. And then there were churches that uh, he couldn't go to, so mm -hmm. I, it's in me. Right. Uh, and, and that helped to build a lot of contacts mm -hmm. all over America. Mm -hmm. It opened doors for me. Mm -hmm. But in 1989, I came home from uh, Missouri, and uh, I got in late at night and uh, was up early as my wife was getting ready to go to work, and I was pulling, pouring me a cup of coffee. And she told me that our pastor of the Lord's Chapel had resigned mm. the day before on Sunday, mm. which was a shock mm -hmm. because he was a founder. Mm -hmm. And the church was the first mega church in this city. Right. That uh, a charismatic. Right. And 
I was putting the coffee carafe back in the pot, in mm -hmm. the cradle. Mm -hmm. And I heard that voice that said, Bobby Preach. Mm -hmm. I heard that voice say, I'm going to put you there. Oh, wow. And when he said that, I laughed. Uh -huh. And Bernice said, what are you laughing at? I said, oh, just, just laughing. Mm -hmm. Because that was the last place I wanted to go. The last thing I wanted what to do. I'm do, very right? happy. Mm -hmm. And we go through this long process of uh, uh, the pastor search, yeah. and I never put my name in the pot. I never said right. I want to be considered mm -hmm. for one of the pastors. And and they got in February of 1990, they're having a church meeting, and Bernice and I are sitting there. And one of the lead elders said, we've narrowed it down to two. Mm -hmm. And someone said, well, would you tell us who the two are? <laughs> and... He said, he called another man's name from Texas, had every degree you could think of, very experienced. And, and he said, and Bobby Howard. Oh, wow. And I almost fell out of my seat that they were even considering me. But what happened was that time that I set that coffee mm -hmm. cup or uh, pot back in the cradle, mm -hmm. that God changed my heart. Mm. from an evangelist heart to a pastor's yeah. heart. Wow. I started craving mm -hmm. this opportunity to serve mm -hmm. that body. Well, they voted the other guy in. Okay. And uh, he was there for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. It didn't work out. And the elders called my wife after church one Sunday mm -hmm. and said, would you tell your husband that we need him to fill in mm -hmm. and come and pastor our church. It sounds like they may not have been listening. <laughs> well, that, that's kind of what kind of what I was thinking. I, I, I know when I got the call, I said to, to Bernice, I said, I said, either I don't know the voice of God or our church has just made a huge mistake. Yeah. And but it's funny how God corrected it. Yes, he just yes. course corrected. Yes, that's awesome. And and, and that was a reassurance. Mm -hmm. It reaffirmed me mm -hmm. that it's not about what the people want. No, it's about what God wants. And it's also not about us pleasing people. Exactly. And that's a big trap that a lot of people fall into. It's not about us pleasing people. It's about us pleasing the Lord. And I know a lot of people would, uh, you know, question where you know women have the right to preach or teach or say anything and at the end of the day just like what you just said I have to remember what did the Lord call me to do exactly not what did, what opinion people may have of that calling because when I get to heaven I'm going to stand before God all by myself exactly and I have to give an account did I do what he called me to right. do right not what people thought I should do and, and so you fell right into exactly what God wanted you to do even though the people weren't quite caught up with exactly. that yet. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know what? God has uh, God has called you. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt. Yeah. He's called you to sing. He's called you to preach, to yeah. proclaim. Uh, I've heard you from the pulpit sitting in the back. I don't know if you knew I was there, but I've heard you. And you're an excellent preacher. Oh, thank you. And I've heard you do this program. And you are very, very good. You're okay. anointed. You don't, those things don't come with just ability to communicate. You gotta have that. Right. It helps, mm -hmm. but if you don't have the anointing, mm -hmm. you're just no. taking up time. Taking up time, so, wasting air. Yeah. I just pray for God's anointing over everything before I sing, before I preach, before I speak. Because without that, you know, I feel like the Bible says we're just, a clanging symbol. I know it's, right. it's talking about love in that in that scripture, but without the anointing, I feel the same way. That yeah. I'm, I'm just making noise, and we don't want to waste people's time making noise. That's, that's for right. sure. But I love the the scripture verse that you have for your church right now. It's Second Timothy two two. Yes, in in 1996, uh, my time of of influence and the ability to continue to lead at the chapel. They had one vision, mm -hmm. that, and they were uh, a church run by elders, mm -hmm. so the pastor had to do what they said, and we came to a, a parting of the ways where uh, I left mm -hmm. in good, good spirits and good feeling, and 
have a good relationship. And many of those people, since that church has dissolved, is here in this congregation. Very good. And I praise God for that. But mm -hmm. I, I heard the Lord say, and the things that you have heard from me mm -hmm. among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Wow. And I felt the Lord say, that is your mission statement. That is your uh, purpose a statement that is your scripture to mm -hmm. hold on to. Nothing supersedes. Right. I'm going to do my best mm -hmm. to to depart knowledge of the Lord mm -hmm. and of His Word to my congregation. Right. And I want them to do the same to commit it to others. Right. And I think that that's one of the biggest um, issues that we face in the church is the lack of discipleship the lack of teaching on discipleship um, because Jesus said, go into the world and make disciples. Yes. And I think we've done a pretty good job of making converts. Yes. But beyond converting and, and accepting Christ as your savior, then it's time to learn how to walk and how to be a Christian. And when you teach, then like you said, they can teach exactly. and, it, and, it, and it keeps going. So when it comes to discipleship, what do you think we need to do? As a as a church and in the whole as a whole. Well, I think that people are accustomed to looking forward mm -hmm. at the preacher or whoever mm -hmm. is in that uh, position, and all the attention seems to be, and and that's where everybody wants to be. I, right. I had one guy that he had uh, the call he felt of the Lord to preach, and uh, I was trying to share with him things he needed to do mm -hmm. to prepare himself because he was not fully committed. I mm -hmm. could, my, my spirit was saying it. His actions were saying it. And he said, I know where my place is and it's in the pulpit. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, his, his place was on the altar before God, mm -hmm. surrendering the areas of his life that had not been totally committed mm -hmm. unto the Lord. Right. And what we do is we look to the pastor, mm -hmm. the leader, the speaker, and then the the pastor often becomes so caught up in, you know, mm -hmm. I'm the man, I'm right. the man, and you're not. Right. Uh, God is, is the one mm -hmm. that we fail to look out and pull from that audience people that are capable and qualified to stand where you stand mm -hmm. and will probably do a whole lot better. Mm -hmm. My objective is to get my congregation preaching better than I've ever dreamed of preaching. Yeah, that's amazing. And I think that when you when you leave the church building, that's where discipleship really begins. Yes. Because I know people, you know, in my own circle that have accepted the Lord as their Savior, but um, they don't know how to walk in mm -hmm. that walk yet. And so when we leave the church and we go back into our neighborhoods around our family and our friends, we are there to teach mm -hmm. because they may not know. And, and, and we speak the truth in love, as the Bible says. We're not, we're not there to get on to them or to make them feel bad. We're there to speak in love. Did you know that this is right. how we're supposed to do this? Right. And did you know that Jesus said this? And so discipleship happens every day in, in our everyday life. Yes. And the pastor, if you have a good pastor, he's equipping you and he's equipping me to equip others. Amen. You love them until they ask you why. Mm -hmm. Got to swing the door open for you to communicate the love of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Why do you love me so much? Why do you care about me? Right. What is, you know, right. that swings the door open to start witnessing and start winning souls. It's the easiest thing in the world to do, but it starts with love. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't think Jesus could have gotten very many followers if he had started with much, much else. Yeah. But he loved the people that had never felt love before. Exactly. You know? Well, uh, 
what I would like for you to do tonight to uh, kind of start wrapping up our program is, could you just pray for those people that may not have accepted Christ as their Savior yes, yet? Yes. And lead them to what Amen. we know today? Honor, we'd love to have you come to know Jesus Christ. Just receive him in your heart. He died for you. Uh, all your sins are already forgiven. Just say this prayer. Dear Lord, forgive me my sins. Come into my heart. Become Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. That's how simple it is. Amen. It is just that simple. Just if you believe simple. in your heart what you spoke with your mouth, then you have received Christ as your Savior. And if you have prayed that prayer uh, with Dr. Howard tonight, I would love to hear about it. And I know he would love to hear about it as yes. well. So if you would, please just email me at tiffanysweely at gmail.com and let me know. Um, and then I would love to just send you a little note back. If you are anywhere near Laverne, please come to the Father's House Church and uh, come hear Dr. Howard preach and their wonderful singing and their loving people that they have here. Thank you again for thank joining you for me having tonight. Me. Thank you for and having thank me. you guys for joining us tonight. Please come back and see us again next week where we will have a, another guest. Thank you and have a good night.